Take your seats. We will, uh, we will resume. Yes, we will resume. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's now my great honor um, to introduce the administrator of the of United States Agency for International Development, actually the acting administrator. <laughs> so uh, Bonnie Glick um, is here, and I was telling uh, Administrator Glick that, uh, that USAID has already been introduced many times this morning. Um, so it, the, the crowd has warmed up, uh, Administrator, so this is, uh, this is good. And we've heard the great work um, that USAID is, uh, has done in Da Nang and is about to do in Benoit, uh, so this is a great opportunity for us to have the Acting Administrator uh, here to speak to us next. So, uh, Administrator Bonnie Glick. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Ambassador Taylor, for that great introduction. Thank you all very much for having me here today. Thank you, too, to the United States Institute of Peace and Nancy Lindborg for hosting this important event. The ability to bring together this exceptional group of participants is a testament to your convening influence here in Washington and the value we all see in events like this one today, where we can share experiences and learn from each other. Thank you, too, to Vice Minister Win Chi Ving and to Senator Leahy for your engagement on this important bilateral relationship. Finally, thanks to the great team from USAID that focuses on hard issues and on advancing our engagement with Vietnam. We're here today celebrating the strong relationship between the United States and Vietnam, due largely to two tracks of engagement that have transpired concurrently. As the United States sought the return of our MIAs, the Vietnamese sought help with their war wounded, and that is where USAID's humanitarian work played a major role. At USAID, our job is to walk alongside our partner countries and join with them on their journeys to self-reliance, to work toward the day when foreign assistance is no longer necessary. I'm so proud of the work that USAID has accomplished with our Vietnamese partners over the past 30 years or so, which has contributed significantly to Vietnam's strong position today. Our predecessor agencies first came to Vietnam in the early 1950s, and we returned as the United States Agency for International Development in 1989 to engage in humanitarian actions that would lay the foundation for our current partnership and closer cooperation. In 1988, President Reagan commissioned a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Vesey, to develop a roadmap to normalization of relations between the United States and Vietnam. Over the course of the next two years, there were five missions that were made to Hanoi, after which General Vesey's team identified the highest priority of each government and submitted a series of recommendations to the president. The U.S. priority was a full accounting of POWs and MIAs, and a process including on-the-ground searches began in 1991, which led to the uncovering of the remains of about 900 American military personnel over the next two decades. In conjunction with those efforts, and thanks to historic legislation spearheaded by Senator Leahy, in 1991, USAID also began a program designed to address the priorities of the government of Vietnam. The first was the needs of Vietnam's war wounded, primarily the estimated 250,000 amputees who had minimal, if any, access to appropriate prosthetic and rehabilitation services. In those early years, USAID's assistance supported the local production and fitting of prosthetic limbs and wheelchairs. The program was designed in cooperation with the Vietnamese government and drew on the services and experiences of American NGOs to develop local Vietnamese government and non-governmental capacities. 
USAID provided high quality prosthetic and rehabilitation training for local staff, the procurement of materials and equipment, and construction of facilities. Consistent with good development policy and practice, USAID also asked the International Society of, for Prosthetics and Orthotics to provide oversight for technical assistance work that was supported under the Leahy War Victims Fund. After the program began, a dictum was added to the USAID supported program guidance, which was nothing about us without us. So we also added a comprehensive program element to build in inclusive social infrastructure in Vietnam, developed along the lines of our own Americans with Disabilities Act to guide all governmental policies and budgets. A lot of barriers had to be broken. A lot of history set aside in the interest of moving forward. But ultimately, USAID's attention to these strategic issues allowed us to develop the necessary trust and confidence of our Vietnamese counterparts for the program to grow and mature. These humanitarian contributions to the Vietnamese people, in parallel with Vietnam's help in recovering our MIAs, demonstrates how such a mutually beneficial approach has contributed to a sustainable and effective bilateral relationship that lasts to this day. USAID continues to support Vietnamese partners in serving the disabled, like the Disability Research and Development Center, the Action to the Community Development Center, and Viet Health. I'm enormously proud of USAID's contribution to this entire historic process of healing and reconciliation. Since the official normalization of relations of the US-Vietnam relationship in 1995, USAID's programming has grown steadily, while Vietnam has made an extraordinary leap in the span of not much more than a generation from a poor country to a rapidly growing economy. Today, we partner with the Vietnamese government and other local organizations in dozens of ways to promote growth, trade, and private industry while raising standards of living. We're fostering investments in the energy sector, including renewable energy. We've helped with legal case reviews to combat wildlife trafficking, worked to modernize labor unions, and la launched a microcredit project for small, women-led businesses in the Mekong Delta. Vietnam is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, and conserving its natural resource base is vital to the country's long-term growth and sustainability. So we're partnering with provincial governments and communities to reduce deforestation and restore degraded landscapes in places like Quan Nam and Thua Tien Hue provinces. We're also working together to build world-class institutions of higher education. Just this past September, Fulbright University Vietnam, with support from USAID, welcomed its first undergraduate class. Other collaborations with engineering, technical, and medical colleges support Vietnam's efforts to develop a 21st century higher education system and produce graduates with skills that employers need to, complete, to compete in an increasingly global marketplace. The world is eager to do business with Vietnam. So USAID has also helped with its government's rewrite of more than 180 commercial laws and regulations to improve the business climate and business competitiveness. Laying the groundwork for these efforts 15 years ago, USAID programming helped support the government of Vietnam in implementing a bilateral trade agreement which in turn added the reforms required for accession to the World Trade Organization in 2007. That was a major turning point in Vietnam's economic growth as it has been for so many other countries. And of course, there's our partnership to clean up another legacy of the war. In 2012, USAID and Vietnamese partners like Vina Yusen, Songza Central, 
Lilama EMC, and BKECC, along with U.S. contractors such as CDM, embarked together on the monumental task of cleaning up soil and sediment at Da Nang Airport, which, contam which was contaminated by Agent Orange. This required processing enough dirt to fill 56 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And by processing, I mean they had to cook most of it in batches above 600 degrees in a two-story oven the size of a football field. That was a technology that was proprietary to a Massachusetts-based small business called TerraTherm. Just getting the oven that hot took several months, and some of the batches had to be heated for as long as two weeks to break down the dioxin. But with skill and determination, I am proud to say this historic remediation was completed last November. Today, Da Nang is a clear, cleaner and safer city, and the airport sits on nearly 75 acres of cleaned land. I'm even prouder to announce that we have officially launched the design phase of the cleanup of Bien Hoa, the largest remaining dioxin hotspot in the country. This month, USAID selected Trigon Associates, a woman-owned small business based in New Orleans, Louisiana, to provide the master plan for the project, along with engineering design and construction management services throughout the cleanup. We expect shovels in the ground later this year during the dry season. <clears throat> this is a big portfolio, but USAID is only one component of the efforts by the United States to support a strong, prosperous, and independent Vietnam, one that contributes to international security and respects human rights and the rule of law. We're a part of the US government's Indo-Pacific strategy which envisions an entire region that is free, open, secure, and prosperous. And the U.S.-Vietnam Development Partnership is absolutely central to that goal. Our bilateral relationship is one of the strongest bulwarks for peace and security in the area. And our partnerships and the friendships we have made along the way are among USAID's greatest success stories. We're continuing to work together to promote inclusive growth and to further open Vietnam to global trade on a level playing field, including with American businesses. Legal reform, increased transparency, streamlined customs, all of these efforts will help to integrate small and medium-sized Vietnamese companies into the global value chain, increasing their economic self-reliance. In all of this work, USAID is committed as a development agency not only to partner with Vietnam today, but also to ensure that the Vietnamese people have the tools necessary to address ongoing and future challenges in a sustainable way. Our contributions over the past 30 years have been instrumental in building the strong relationship that we enjoy today and laying the foundation for even closer partnership moving forward in broader regional issues like trade and security. We're proud to be part of Vietnam's development journey and look forward to a bright future ahead. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. This progress that we have made is truly a cause for celebration, and I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you. The next panel, we can uh, please uh, begin moving up to the, uh, there we are. That's all they needed was an invitation, and that, and that we have. <clears throat> so the next panel, um, moderated by Dr. Charles Bailey, um, who is coming right up as we speak, um, will focus on the healing from the destruction of war. And Dr. Bailey will, uh, will introduce his panel members, please. Thank you very much, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Um, 
I'm moderating panel two, which looks at uh, the physical destruction of war, specifically from unexploded ordinances or UXO and Agent Orange. We have a panel of people with deep experience in this area, and I will introduce them, and they will come and, and join me here. Jerry Gilbert. Jerry is at the State Department, where he is Chief of Programs in the Bureau of Weapons Abatement and uh, Weapons Removal and Abatement. Uh, Tao Griffiths. Tao is Senior Policy Advisor at the Vietnam um, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and for many years she headed Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation uh, programs in Vietnam, uh, delivering services to UXO and Agent Orange victims. Uh, Colonel Tan Tang Kong, Colonel Kong, Colonel Tong. Colonel Kong is in the Ministry of Defense in Hanoi, where he directs Committee 701, an interministerial group that is um, headed by the Prime Minister and is charged with leading Vietnam's response to war legacies. Senior Lieutenant General Nguyen Van Ring. General Ring retired after many years of military service and uh, is now the president, welcome, is now the president of the Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent Orange, uh, uh, commonly known as VAVA. And Chris Abrams from USAID Hanoi. Chris directs the Office of Environment and Social Development in USAID Hanoi, where he oversees USAID's projects in dioxin remediation at Bien Hoa and health and disability assistance to the severely disabled in the provinces that were most heavily sprayed during, during the war. Um, I'll say a few words uh, uh, to sort of set the scene, and uh, then we will talk, we'll, uh, we'll turn to each of our panelists. Uh, I'm asking them to speak in the order in which they were uh, introduced and to begin with telling us a few words more about their backgrounds and how they came to be experts in, in this field. But just to remind, we're talking about two war legacies that continue to be uh, challenges in, in Vietnam, unexploded ordnance and, and Agent Orange. The, during the war, U.S. aircraft uh, dropped explosive munitions over Vietnam, and about 10 percent of them failed to detonate. They lie uh, just below the surface, uh, awaiting contact, uh, to even today. The area of contamination with UXO is about 18 percent of the land area. This is uh, concentrated in the province of Quang Chi since 1996. Um, the uh, U.S. has supported, has worked with Vietnam in uh, UXO clearance in Quang Chi. The UXO casualty rate used to be 70 to 80 people per year. Last year it was zero. So I'm going to say that again. For the first time since the end of the war, there were no deaths from UXO in Quang Chi province in 2018. This is a remarkable milestone. And during the war, U.S. aircraft uh, sprayed Agent Orange over selected strategic areas um, to uh, defoliate forests and destroy crops. Um, they eventually covered about 15 percent of the land area of then South Vietnam. Um, it was contaminated with, a, with dioxin, a highly toxic poison which uh, is odorless and colorless and can only be detected through modern sophisticated laboratory tests. Unlike UXO, questions about what exactly had become of the dioxin that came to Vietnam in Agent Orange and what were its impacts on people were subjects of deep disagreement between the U.S. and Vietnam for a very long time. In, Two breakthroughs occurred during this, uh, during the 2000s. The first was the realization that um, the dioxin was actually a, concentrated at three former American bases where the spray panes had been based. 
And these were the areas that were deeply contaminated and deserved um, first attention. These are Phukat, Da Nang, and Bien Hoa, and we'll hear more about them in a moment. This uh, dioxin hypothesis helped clear away the fog of war, which had lingered over this subject for many years, where there were fears that large areas of the country were, were contaminated with dioxin. But no, we understand it to be a point source problem at these three locations. There's a similar uh, clarification of understanding. Uh, not so long ago, everyone with a disability in Vietnam uh, might feel that they were a victim of Agent Orange, and this also made the problem very difficult to tackle. But we have found that, in fact, those um, people with very severe disabilities of upper and lower body, uh, physical impairment and mental and develop, uh, incapacity and developmental delay are the people that we really should be talking about. And we now know uh, more about who they are and where they are. And so, in 2007, 32 years after the end of the war, and thanks to Senator Patrick Leahy, the U.S. and Vietnam began to address these war legacies. Um, and since 2007, uh, through the U.S. AID programs have benefited, have touched the lives of some tens of thousands of disabled Vietnamese. And in 2007, as we've just, 2017, as we've just heard, the two governments completed the task of remediation at the, at the Da Nang airport. American veterans and their families have also been affected. And in fact, uh, both Vietnam and the US follow very similar lists of diagnostic criteria for identifying those who have been affected. I'm pleased to see Bobby Muller here. Bobby has worked tirelessly since he came from home from the war uh, for the benefit of uh, American veterans and uh, Mills Griffiths also and Fred Downs uh, whom we heard from earlier. Uh, we want to thank you for all you did for so many people. I think in 2015, 528,000 American veterans were receiving benefits from the Veterans Administration. Thank you. Our panelists are going to have stories about themselves in a moment. I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about myself. In uh, 1997, I got a phone call from Susan Beresford, the president of the Ford Foundation, and she said, uh, Charles, we'd like you to go to Vietnam and um, head our program in Hanoi. And I said, after gulping, uh, sure. And, uh, and I said, what do you have in mind, Susan? She said, well, you go there, you'll figure it out. This was actually a very nice mandate. And I said, well, um, how much, what's my budget? And she said, well, $10 million a year. And so that's when I arrived in Hanoi to begin a program in sort of, of if you will, in normal mode, uh, funding higher education, economic development, health, and um, cultural programs. But um, a short time there after, I was on a trip to the Central Highlands into Dak Lot Province, and uh, I was shown a valley that had been devastated by Agent Orange. And this became um, an itch that I had to scratch. And it became a program of Ford Foundation grant making that went on for 11 years. And I moved from being a grant maker to more an advocate for the possibilities and the opportunity of bringing our two countries together to put this terrible war and this awful legacy behind us, the sooner the better. How are we going to do that? Um, first, eliminating the future threat of unexploded ordnance and dioxin by clearing up the former and cleaning up the latter. Second, caring for those who have already been afflicted. Our panelists will address both of these needs. So I'd like to begin with uh, Jerry. If you could just tell us how you came to this work and then I'd like to know more about what you found works. Obviously, we have a wonderful success in Quang Chi. How did that happen? Good to go? Okay. Uh, 
Thanks very much for that. Uh, real briefly about myself, I, I joined the State Department about 16 years ago. Uh, in that time, I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of different foreign assistance programs and other things that the State Department does. But when I had the chance to join the Office of Weapons Removal and Debatement uh, in 2012, I really jumped at the opportunity um, because it's extremely rewarding to know um, that you're making a difference in so many lives and that you're helping some of the people around the world who need that assistance the most. You know, being able to say uh, to other people who ask what you do for a living that you save lives, um, that's a pretty remarkable thing and it's something that I hope I'll be able to continue saying that I do uh, for years to come. In terms of, you know, what we found has worked uh, in terms of clearing UXO in Vietnam and what's made, made the program effective and efficient, um, I want to hit on a, a couple of points. Um, first off, it's about a great and true partnership uh, that we have with the government of Vietnam. Um, a lot of times we say, oh, we provide foreign assistance to a country. Um, but we're not necessarily assisting that country. We're really doing whatever it is for them. In Vietnam, that's not the case. In, in Vietnam, we have a national government that is committed at its highest levels to clearing UXO. And that commitment goes all the way down to the very working level and the provincial governments. It's a, a true commitment and it's a true partnership which Vietnam shows um, through the substantial national resources that it devotes uh, on its own to clearing UXO. Um, Vietnam by far is responsible for the majority of UXO clearance operations that take place in the country on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, mainly through their Ministry of National Defense and, and their national operators such as Bomasin. Um, when it comes to partner governments with whom we work, and we're active in about 60 countries around the world today, Vietnam is definitely right at the top of that list when it comes to governments that are as committed to devoting their own resources. Uh, to the effort. And when you have a government that's that committed, um, it makes it easy for your assistance to be effective because you really are assisting them with something that they're already doing on their own. I think the, the second thing that really has made for a, a strong and effective program in Vietnam is uh, the open-minded approach uh, that we've seen from a lot of our, our government partners there, especially the provincial government uh, in Quang Tri. Quang Tri Provincial Government has never been afraid to try new technologies or look at new ways of doing things and experiment with new methodologies. Because in Vietnam, they want the same thing that we want, and that's to stretch our assistance dollars as far as possible, to clear as much UXO as we can with the money that we have while we have it. So in places like Quang Tri, um, it's led to some new and innovative approaches to clearing UXO. Um, one of the things that's really been a tremendous success story uh, for Vietnam with implications for how we clear UXO around the world is the development of what we call the Cluster Munitions Remnant Survey methodology. And Cluster Munitions Remnant Survey methodology is all about focusing on the kind of UXO that causes the most casualties and it's the most dangerous and unstable. Those are cluster, munition, cluster submunitions that failed to detonate as intended. We found that they by far were causing the, the greatest number of casualties due to UXO incidents. And if you can find cluster submunitions that are unexploded, you're also likely to find a lot of other UX types of UXO, unexploded artillery shells, unexploded mortar shells, and that sort of thing, in the immediate vicinity. So by focusing on cluster munitions and doing that in a systematic way, we're able to deal with UXO in a way that's manageable. And it's through uh, partnership, strong partnerships with the national government, the Vietnam National Mine Action Center, and it's through the commitment of the Quang Tri government that we're able to say that we think we are on track to making Quang Tri, which was the most heavily contaminated with UXO, free from the impact of UXO by 2025, the end of 2025. It's a, a big goal to say that we're striving for, but it is something that is definitely achievable with the resources that we have today. Um, and we really want to point to Quang Tri, making it you know, the success story that it's become as a model for how you effectively run a UXO program, not just in Vietnam, but around the world. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tao Griffiths. Tao? Um. I was born after the war, the war entered, the, the Vietnam War entered, and um, I was born and raised on the border town on the northernmost part of Vietnam, China. And um, I, um, my first introduction to war legacy issues, uh, stories about accidents in my own community on the border, 
where cattle stepped on landmines and cattle died and people died. And that's how I got to know about war legacy. And President Clinton came to Vietnam in 2000. During that time, I was up in my hometown in Hazang and I hear his speech where he pledged that the United States of America will help Vietnam to address the consequence of war and particularly the issue of UXO on a national level. And with that came with an advertisement or newspaper. I applied for it. I got the job with Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation with Bobby Muller. And I ended up working there for 16 years without knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I started 18 years ago, I didn't know much about the vast consequence of the American war in Vietnam, as we call it. And um, through the work that I learned about, I will share with you one particular story that is very vivid in my own memory. And that happened in the New Year holiday in central part of Vietnam. And that was in the first week of 2014. So it's a few years ago. And um, there was an explosion right in Dong Nai, which is near the Binh Hoa Air Base, where you heard about. And one person lost their life, and that's Ming, and he's 17 years old, and he was tending cows on the field. A few days later, there was an explosion in another province in the coastal city of Vietnam called Binh Thuận, and it took the lives of two young men. Both of them were born after the war, same age with me. I didn't know them but the story was very familiar. And then of that same day, later in the afternoon, there was another explosion in Quang Binh province, which is in the northern part of the DMZ. And the boy was digging earthworm so that he could go fishing. His name was Duan, and he's only 13 years old, and he was quickly taken to the hospital in Hue for surgery. So within a few days, during the New Year holiday in Vietnam, four Vietnamese people came into contact with explosive ordnance led from the war more than 40 years ago. Three of them died. One was severely injured. I thought it was a lot. But it's, I'm glad to hear now that in Quang Chi, you have a model that has a zero impact that we could work toward 2025. There can be no more impact of UXO in Quang Chi. And let's hope that we could replicate that model to other provinces in Vietnam. And the impact of UXO is not only in Quang Chi or only in central Vietnam, it is also in the southern part of the country and also in my hometown on the border with China. But I want to also share another story, and that is about um, Many of you might remember stories on the front page during the visit of the USS Carson, where after docking, soon after that, the crew members and sailors came to visit a center of children with disabilities and children could be affected by Agent Orange. And those images was broadcast all over Vietnam and also in the US, it was very moving. And I had the opportunity to work in that center for many years, work with them. And it is a local chapter of VAVA, Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent Orange. And over many years of going there, I came to meet with a little boy called Hui. He came from a poor family living in close proximity to the Da Nang airport, which was still contaminated by dioxin up until two years ago, or one year ago, two years ago, 2017. The boy had many deformities. I came to know him, and he got to, to, to come to the center every day, learn, have a special education, learn to sing, to dance, martial art. He's very happy. For him, that center is a place of joy. I really hope that model of excellence could be replicated throughout the country and with the support of, UX, uh, of USAID. The boy keep telling me, I mean, he's deaf and also moot, but he told his friends that 
I am not very smart because he tried to teach me how to communicate with my sign language. I couldn't, but he thought it was fun to play with me because I was able to do martial art. But I keep coming back. His story reminds me and inspires me that we could do a lot more to help people like Hui and the center where he felt that he belonged to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tao, for those, those moving stories. And now we turn to Colonel Tan Tang Kong. Uh, sir, I'd, we'd love to hear how you first heard about um, these uh, war legacies and more particularly about your work and how they, um, how, what you have accomplished at the Da Nang Airport. Uh, first thing, uh, thank you. Let me introduce myself. I was born uh, in the 1960s. When I was uh, young, I witnessed uh, the uh, bombings of the U.S. to the northern part of Vietnam, and therefore I understood the uh, heavy consequences of the war, and especially when I grew up and up to now, I realized that uh, uh, the U.S. Oil consequences is quite heavy with the uh, maps of U.S. Oil contamination uh, uh, revealed by the U.S. and about the diocese Eric and Orange. It is not uh, uh, publicly uh, uh, announced uh, in the media, but 1995, I was lucky enough to uh, study at the uh, Remi uh, Environment Center uh, belong to the uh, Chemical Corps, but at that time, uh, those data are also not published, but in 2010, I officially was assigned to uh, work at the environment management at the MND, and specifically to manage the uh, diocesan remediation project of the hotspots, and especially with the support of the US. Uh, those are the activities and work that we have been doing, and uh, so far we have been involved in uh, uh, the project at the Da Nang, and we uh, basically uh, completed that project. And those are a very uh, short description of my work and my experience. The question about the public health benefits from this work and how will you achieve these same benefits at the much larger Bien Hoa project? But well, about the health uh, issue, based on the uh, uh, researchers, the exposure, uh, exposure to diocin that has passed is mostly through uh, the chain of uh, food uh, and mostly originated from uh, the air bases. So in order to remediate the diocin at uh, Da Nang Airport, we completed already, we we'll contribute to the prevention of uh, spreading of diocin to from the airport to the uh, outside areas, especially through the uh, uh, food train, because we understand that uh, diocin uh, uh, does not resolve uh, water, but through the uh, rain, it spread to the uh, other areas. And in those lakes or uh, rivers, uh, we raise a fish, uh, ducks, and uh, with the food uh, selling out to the market, uh, that's one of the sources to affect to the health of people living nearby. And therefore, uh, for the remediation of uh, the diocin at the airport and nearby areas will help to prevent the uh, exposure and the spreading of diocin to the lo local communities. And we also have to uh, admit that the high contaminated soil have been uh, remedied already, but the low remediated uh, soil uh, is isolated, but uh, we also have an agreement to uh, isolate them to uh, minimize the spreading of diocin. And we will continue to observe the uh, environment of the isolated area as well as the uh, soil under the uh, lake. Otherwise, uh, we still have the risk of diocin contamination by the animals uh, living nearby. Thank you. Our next speaker is Senior Lieutenant General Nguyen Van Ring. Uh, sir, would you tell us how you first became involved with this subject and what are what and about your work with Baba? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, I was uh, used to be a soldier and uh, uh, fighting in the southern battles of uh, Vietnam from 1967 to 1975. 
And during the uh, world time, I witnessed with my own eyes the U.S. Air Force uh, spraying missions and forests destroyed by those spray missions. And I also see uh, that the uh, animals uh, living in those areas uh, killed uh, uh, by uh, the toxic chemicals. And we stationed in the uh, uh, location uh, without uh, uh, the cover of forest. In uh, 1968, of the Tet Offensive uh, campaign, my artillery location was, uh, and I myself command that unit. And for the first time, uh, we directly uh, uh, exposed to the toxic chemicals by the U.S. Air Force to our battlefield. And among the, uh, in the uh, Agent Orange, uh, uh, we are soldiers. And of course, with our uh, bare eyes, we uh, could not realize either it's to toxic or not. But in reality, many of our soldiers uh, exposed heavily by Agent Orange, even with food, water, also exposed to those toxic chemicals. And I can see that uh, after a few days, uh, the uh, forests uh, lose their leaves and died after that. And our soldiers uh, got uh, high fever, uh, several diseases. And it can be said that the uh, impact, uh, uh, that affected also their uh, fighting uh, uh, after that. And uh, after the war, uh, I have several times uh, met them again. And I realized that uh, for those veterans who were exposed to the Agent Orange, uh, they still bring in their body uh, acute diseases. And especially the children were born with uh, deformity. And many kids uh, you know, could not uh, take care of themselves. And they cannot uh, do anything for the society. And even the mother uh, say that, uh, I like it, uh, you to call me mam mama when uh, you were born. But after 30 years, uh, he could not say even mama, and that's the you know compassion of uh, a woman to his uh, uh, to her baby. But for our veterans, uh, many of them died because of uh, severe diseases. And among the 17 diseases uh, that the uh, uh, U.S. Institute identified, we. Our veterans have all of, the, of those acute diseases, and hundreds of them died. And hundreds of thousands of uh, veterans uh, living a uh, 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 suffering life, and maybe even they do not want to live that way if they live. Uh, no ring. Our, our final panelist is uh, Chris Abrams. And Chris, how did you? find yourself in Hanoi doing this kind of work. And then I have a couple of questions to follow up with you. Sure. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Charles and, and my fellow panelists. Uh, I am, well, I work with USAID, and I'm uh, the Foreign Service Officer uh, assigned uh, as the director of the office that manages our Agent Orange remediation programs and our support to persons with disabilities. And it's been my privilege to be there for the last four years, though of course, all the work that I do is building on all the people that were before me, and I think it's a very um, exciting time um, as we see a lot of these projects uh, uh, move forward in advance. As, as you've heard today, we had the project at Da Nang, which um, I find uh, is one of the most technically challenging uh, projects of my career. It was uh, very interesting to be part of, I mean, not just in terms of politics and uh, diplomacy and working with our partners at the Ministry of National Defense, um, but just in terms of the actual technical complexity of bringing a dioxin up to 330, 335 degrees, or soil up to 335 degrees Celsius to actually break apart dioxin and recognizing how tough um, this challenge is to really return uh, the environment to what it was before uh, it was contaminated with, uh, with Agent Orange. I have two follow-up questions. Um, first, what is the funding plan for the full remediation of Bien Hoa? How long will it take, and what is required? 
Sure. So uh, we talked a lot about Da Nang, which was a, was a big effort. Uh, it was one of the largest remediation projects in the world. Bien Hoa is vastly larger. It's roughly four to five times the size of Da Nang. And based on a, a, a fairly comprehensive study that we did with the Ministry of National Defense, uh, we recognize that the, the concentrations and the quantity of dioxin contamination there is, is, is much, much higher. And also, over time, that dioxin has migrated off base over time into the surrounding areas around that, that air base. So a project of that size and scale um, could go as much as over a billion dollars, depending on the types of technologies that you would use to, um, to approach it or how, how you manage uh, the different types of concentrations of soil. So it was a big effort when you go to work to muster the will of uh, the United States government to contribute um, and working internally between the Department of State, USAID, and, and Department of Defense. Uh, the United States has managed to make a commitment of at least uh, $300 million towards a what we've estimated to be about $390 million to, to accomplish uh, the mission there, which will include cleaning the areas off base and on base. And what that entail, as Colonel Kong mentioned, is essentially taking low concentration material and permanently uh, storing it and keeping it out of harm's way and taking high concentration material and either thermally treating or using other technologies to, to manage it. Thank you. Can you also go on and talk about the other very important, I would say even more important part of your program, which is health and disability assistance. I understand that it is now focused in, on helping or reaching uh, and positively impacting the lives of the severely disabled and their families. And you're currently working in seven provinces that were heavily sprayed during the war. And according to your disability surveys, there are about 95,000 people who are classified as severely disabled in these seven districts. How are you going to reach them? And what kind of help can you offer? Sure. So um, uh, USAID's support to, to persons with disabilities, as, as Charles mentioned, is now we're trying to focus that on provinces that were heavily sprayed by Agent Orange during the war. And in fact, we've identified up to 10 uh, candidates, but we're currently working in seven based on the, the resources that we have. And when it comes to the challenge of improving the quality of life of persons with disabilities, you need to work with a variety of partners. So we work with the, the Ministry of National Defense on dioxin uh, remediation and soon on helping us coordinate uh, support to uh, persons that were affected uh, by Agent Orange, uh, organizations like VAVA, um, lots of NGOs, many people that are here, uh, here today, and uh, the Ministry of Health, provincial authorities, and other. Essentially, you have to create almost like a community of services uh, to support persons with disabilities. And we really need to, to work together with Vietnam to build a system that will deliver those services long into the future. But at the same time, as, as Charles mentioned, you know, a really important element that we need to get at are focusing on persons with severe disabilities. And there's a need today. So, so roughly, we've kind of split our, our resources, you know, 50% of those go for direct services to persons uh, with severe disabilities in these provinces, while the remainder works to build the rehabilitation system for service delivery, and that includes uh, developing occupational, physical, and uh, speech and language therapy programs at the university level to build the next generation of Vietnamese health practitioners to deliver these services, um, and then also recognizing the social support. So uh, I guess you could, you could say palliative care, but, but really making sure that caregivers and uh, disabled persons have access to social services within their communities. And that's where organizations like VAVA are, are fantastic. They have this network that can go down and work at every, every commune um, and, and really kind of create a, sort of a community uh, of support for persons with disabilities, sort of a, a medical uh, rehabilitation support uh, uh, framework, and then also getting directly to the houses of those with severe disabilities with direct services, um, assistive devices, home improvements, and, and other methods. And that's what Th we're... Thank you. Thank you very much. We now are going to uh, turn to you, the audience, for your very good questions, and there are mic people with microphones circulating around. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions. 
Um, this gentleman in the middle here. Here comes the mic um, uh, over to your left. Will you please uh, give your name and your affiliation? And sure. Uh, George Black. I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've written for a lot of publications about Vietnam, including on Quang Tri and the UXO and Agent Orange problems for The New Yorker and The Nation and others. I'm particularly interested in the question of how the Bien Hoa cleanup is different from Da Nang, not in respect of scale or complexity, but in terms of the military significance within the broader relationship, the fact that it is a military base, and the fact that the Pentagon is now very significantly involved. Let, let me ask, you're directing this question to which of the... Really at anyone. I mean, I think everyone might have a view, perhaps uh, Chris the, to start, the, but uh, can, can you restate no DOD it, people. Can you restate it as one question? Uh, how Benoit is significantly different in respect of the involvement of the Pentagon in the project. Uh, Chris, would you like to... Sure. Well, I think... Um, well, one is I think that the Department of Defense has always been uh, very supportive, and, and you know USAID and the Department of Defense work work well together in, in the countries that that we coexist together within. Um, I think one of the big uh, reasons that Department of Defense has has joined uh, USAID in supporting Bienwa is is the sheer scale of it. So um, Da Nang being smaller, and I, I, um, and this does speak to some of the complexity. Um, USAID could. Uh, provide enough support to uh, achieve that, that goal, along with our partners in Vietnam. But Bien Hoa, given the scale, uh, really required a, a joint effort between several U.S. government agencies, and that's how uh, the State Department, DOD, and, and USAID uh, created this uh, uh, group uh, and sort of collective funding and resources to, to approach that problem. And I think that DOD, um, in particular, has, has a, a lot of interest in, in Vietnam, and they've been working with the Vietnamese for, for many years um, on this, and it's an important issue for the country, um, and it's an important thing for the U.S. government to do, and, um, and, and maybe that's the key point. It's the U.S. government, um, just USAID happens to be the technical expert in that project, but it's really our whole government that's, uh, that's making this commitment. Other questions? Um, yes, in the back there. Hi, I'm Jerry File. I was uh, visited Quang Tri Province in 1967, courtesy of the United States Marine Corps. And I was wondering the receptiveness of your programs with the Mountain Yard tribes and the other tribes uh, in Vietnam. And your question is for which panelists? Uh, the gentleman that uh, is in uh, Quang Tri. Okay. Uh, Oh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure which one. Uh, General, uh, perhaps General Ring will answer that question about Quang Chi. Yeah. Maybe, could you restate the question for the interpretation? I was uh, asking about the receptiveness of the mountain yard tribes and the other tribes that live in the mountains up in the Quezon area and the other parts of Vietnam how receptive they are to these programs that uh, are being introduced. The ethnic minorities. Uh, in Quang uh, province, uh, maybe the uh, uh, three best, uh, the, 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 the most affected by uh, USO and also most affected by the uh, Daosian, they have uh, more than any other provinces. So the impact of uh, both Iwaso and uh, Daosian to the livelihood of uh, people is very severe. And I can say that they do not uh, know when they, uh, uh, and uh, how long they can die, uh, live and when they die. They do not know about that. And that's why our government very uh, pay very special attention to those communities. And we invest a lot of resources to overcome the USL consequences to free the lands uh, for production. And at the same time, uh, uh, we can eliminate, eliminate a threat to their lives. And uh, for those efforts, uh, uh, we uh, also got support from USAID. And the second, uh, about the 
children in Guangxi uh, province. Uh, they also uh, receive uh, special attention from our government to, like, uh, to build the uh, centers to uh, nurture them, even for the uh, tribes in those areas, both uh, the uh, minority groups and the uh, king groups. And we also build uh, vocational training centers also uh, to uh, support their livelihood uh, means. And I can see uh, that, you know, country uh, is uh, the forefront of the uh, world in Vietnam and the place where the two sides uh, wishes uh, to get their strength in order to uh, finally win the, uh, the world. But, and that's why during the, uh, the world uh, in country province, they are the heroic people and they stood firm during the war and uh, currently they uh, gradually overcome the difficulties and challenges to, uh, to build a better life uh, as other provinces do. And thank you. To share with you the share with experience that I worked in Alui um, district, Hui province, near Khe Sang that you mentioned. A few years ago, with the funding from Boeing Company, uh, through Vietnam Veterans of America, America Foundation, we went to Alui and built two schools, one primary school, one kindergarten it's for the community there. And the community, as you mentioned, they're mountain yard people. Like we call it ethnic minority, the Vân Kiều people. And for most people who are young, born after the war, so they were overwhelmed overwhelmingly happy that they have new schools in the community for the children to go to school. But for older generation who remember the war, when they ask us who we were, we say, I mean, I'm not Americans, but I represent Vietnam veterans and friendship that they extend to people of Vietnam. And also companies, the Boeing company, the B-52 manufacturer coming back to Vietnam. And so it means a lot. It's a friendship and it was very well received by the mountain art communities that I have visited and worked in the past. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, let's see, right here. Hello, my name is uh, Brandy Worrell, and I'm with the Children of Vietnam Vets Health Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization of children who have medical conditions linked to our father's or mother's exposure to Agent Orange. And tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of my father's passing from metastatic lung cancer due to Agent Orange exposure. Um, it was written on his death certificate by the VA. Um, so my question is, being um, Amerasian or mixed race, my mom's from Long An province, and I don't know how much Agent Orange was dropped on Long An province during the war. Um, before she had me, she had suffered several miscarriages and a stillbirth. Um, and Can you um, form your yeah. question, please? Sure. So. I know we have tracked uh, illnesses from vets and illnesses from Vietnamese. Do we have any compensation or tracking for Vietnamese immigrants in the United States? I don't know that anyone on the panel can answer that question. Uh, because obviously it would affect them. Yeah. I know that there are, uh, first of all, um, I very much respect what you are doing with the um, Children of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance, and it represents um, a need and an opportunity that um, that I think we Americans have to address. And um, and the way to start is what you're doing, organizing and standing up and speaking uh, on this subject. In Vietnam, they talk about intergenerational, and we've been talking about uh, these uh, effects uh, here in this panel. Uh, we are not quite there yet, I would say. Maybe that's an understatement. Anyway, thank you very much for your question. I'm, we have to end our panel now, and I would just like to say that um, what have we learned? We've learned uh, one thing that I learned in Vietnam is that the Vietnamese are very good at organizing models, small pilot projects, which they want to see if something works before they expend the time and effort to take it to a larger area. The most famous example of this 
was uh, Gwynton Van Ling, who did experiments on um, commercial agriculture, small-scale agriculture, in the Mekong Delta in the 19, early 1980s, and that ultimately became Doi Moi, the uh, reform and renovation movement that created modern Vietnam. We have here also models. Quang Chi shows us how you can both educate people on mine awareness and clear up uh, the, uh, the UXO, and this is being spread to other provinces. We have Da Nang, which we think has been an unqualified success, and there has been a lot of learning which we couldn't have tackled Bien Hoa. We should not have never tried to even think of tackling Bien Hoa without doing Da Nang first, simply because of the scale and the complexity. We have also uh, seven provinces where USAID is cooperating with Vietnam, uh, beginning with uh, Tai Ninh province. And all of these are going to um, build programs and implement projects that will take us to the next uh, level. Uh, the victims of Agent Orange and UXO in Vietnam are often described as a humanitarian concern, which we're doing something about, and this is true. But these are just not nice projects. The, these are fundamental to the future of the relationship between our two countries, between Vietnam and the US. So in closing, I would leave you with five words. Progress, partnership, a shared future. Join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>